I decided that if I were ever going to be able to accomplish my goal of, of making films, that I should have a niche, that I had, should have something that I felt strongly about. I came across a book uh, called Where the Red Fern Grows. My, my wife had been aware of it. She's in children's literature and understood a lot about uh, what is, uh, what's on the edge of uh, being uh, successful. I read the book and I thought it resonated in so many ways. I understood a lot of the, of the feelings of the, uh, of the protagonist and, uh, and felt internally that this would be the right kind of a, a story to do. Having had practically no experience in it, which, as it turns out, was an advantage, I, uh, I made a call to uh, Doubleday. Uh, I just looked in the jacket of the book, and there was Doubleday. I looked up the phone number, and uh, I talked to a, to a young lady that was representing the book. She, uh, we talked about what I could uh, acquire it for. We did an option. We we managed uh, to make arrangements to do an option for twenty five thousand dollars. That is to say, I would pay. Uh, $2,500 and I'd have a year to make the film or have to renew the, uh, the option. And uh, I felt I had little to lose, although $2,500 even then was a lot of money. So I, uh, I went to my father-in-law. Uh, his name is Doty, and that's why the company we've had is uh, Doty Dayton Productions. I talked to him about the, the film budget. I'd met some people that I knew that had been in the business all of their lives. I brought them in and we talked about uh, what it would cost to do the film. And uh, given that we had not big names, but names that were known. And, uh, and so at that point in time, I, I felt like we could start putting things together. They indicated to me a sort of, they were a little embarrassed because the agent that was handling this thing had not been aware that there was a clause in Mr. Rawls, who was the author of the book's contract, that he had to approve whoever it was that was going to do the film. And therefore, I, I was left with the task of meeting Mr. Rawls and uh, getting his approval to have the contract uh, go through. I made arrangements to, uh, I got a flight, Western Airlines, and kind of rehearsed in my mind what I was going to say. I knew that, uh, for some reason or other, I knew that the title of the book was important to him. And typically, it, you'd like to get a, a more succinct title, you know, one word or two word title. And of course, Where the Red Fern Grows was, was not uh, that kind of a title. But I knew that that was important to him, and I knew that the other thing was that was important was uh, making it as authentic as as possible. And uh, so I had had rehearsed in my mind that I would say to him, "We want to keep the same title, and I will be true to the book as I possibly can be." So when I knocked on the door, in anticipation of seeing him, he he opened up the door. And I said, Mr. Rawls, I'm Lyman Dayton. I love your book. I, uh, of course, have been negotiating with Doubleday, and they say that you need the approval. And there were there are two things that I'd like to say to you before we uh, before we go any further, and that is that uh, I want to keep the title of the book and give you that assurance that we will. And the second thing is, is that I will be as true to the story as I possibly can. He paused for a moment, and then he, he, he reached out his hand, and he says, uh, well then, uh, Mr. Dayton, you've got it. So <laughs> he told me that, and we talked about the movie, and it went on for hours and hours. And then I looked at my watch, and I realized, wait a minute, I, I've got I've to get back home. I've got to catch the airplane. So I went back, uh, I went to the airport, and the only flight back to L.A. had uh, was now gone. And uh, I was destitute. I, had, I didn't have uh, a lot of money. 
And uh, I thought, well, what am I going to do? And it was freezing cold. It started to snow. Uh, I'm stranded. I can't go back to to see <laughs> Mr. Rawls and uh, and uh, you know the big producer. And so I uh, I decided what I'd do is uh, hitchhike because 120 miles from Idaho Falls was my hometown of Cokeville. Then I could get with my my parents. The only problem was is that it started snowing very heavily and there was very very little traffic and I stood there freezing. Uh, finally, this uh, this guy came fishtailing up uh, to where I was and uh, skidded to a stop and and uh, the moment I opened the door, it went reeked with alcohol, but it was warm and I had never felt such a generous <laughs> uh, offering. Uh, in my life and and he offered he says sure i'll give you a ride and now it's getting kind of late and uh he pulls off to the side of the road and pulls into this tiny little hamlet <laughs> it was called mccannon idaho and uh, he says uh I, this is where i am I, I can't go any further and there was absolutely no uh traffic where i could get another ride but uh out of the kindness of his, his heart, he says, oh, but you can stay at my place. So I said, well, that's great. And so he pulls up to a sheep wagon. And I said, uh, th this is your home? And he said, yes, yeah, this is where I live. And uh, he says, you're welcome to, uh, there, there was a big overstuffed chair in, in, the, uh, in this tiny aisle. And there was, of course, a mattress up, up higher where he slept. And so I, having no other choice, I spent the night, uh, Lyman, the big movie mogul, spent the night uh, sleeping in this overstuffed chair, although I didn't sleep well. Getting the funding for this film was, uh, was a real challenge. Um, it was, I mean, how was I, as a, as a first time really producer, uh, going to attract the kind of money that I felt was necessary. And at the time, for independence, uh, $750,000 was a lot of money. Thankfully, my father-in-law, who was a very successful physician, was willing to put up his, uh, his financial statement to get half the funding. And uh, so we, after several meetings, the bank committed uh, to, without having his having to put up collateral he, he managed to get a to do that and of course that that was the that was the thing that was needed in order to make uh, everything else work my job was to go out and get the rest i had visited a guy by the name of jim mccullough who as it turns out was interested in the rights and was kind of sick that he didn't get them but we ended up actually setting up uh, some limited partnerships and not during the film but after the fact managed to get all of the funding that we needed for the post-production. But that was a struggle too. But it also meant that we would have uh, more ownership than we would have had uh, otherwise. I had some experienced people. One of them was Hubie Kearns, who was, the, who was, the, uh, who was a big uh, football star and, and track star for USC and later became the double for Batman. And... and uh, he taught me so many things, and he brought me all kinds of... He, he'd worked with so many people in television. We couldn't afford a full-blown uh, cinematographer that had done the big films. I was notified by a young man by the name of Dean Cundy uh, that he would be interested in talking to us. As I recall, uh, Dean uh, was about... Uh, 27 or 28 years old. He had done a, a student film that he showed, showed me uh, that probably 20 or 30 minutes long. And it just was, it was done so exquisitely. And it turns out that it, that the, the way that he did it was kind of get kind of uh, this kind of a feeling that I really, really saw for, uh, for what Redfern. I, I met a great deal of opposition on that one. 
I, of course, was not well established as Red Fern was actually one of my very, very first movies ever. I know that I was very intrigued by the, the project, so it was fascinating. And it was being directed by Norman Tokar, who was, you know, a very established uh, Disney live action director. So, uh, you know, it was like a really interesting project for me. I had just built uh, the movie van, I believe, which was a van that uh, had equipment in it. And, you know, I had a team of guys, basic uh, key guys, you know, Gaffer and Key Grip and everything. So, uh, yeah, I think I was able to offer them a package. The idea was to always save a company work with having to put together a package of equipment and rent it from here and there and so on. So it did what it was supposed to do, which was made me appealing to uh, low-budget productions that were actually looking for quality. It was a very lucky pairing for me to um, have a show that was quality, that was not, you know, just cars exploding and, and uh, action and poor acting and all. You know, it was, it was a fascinating experience for me because it had a very experienced director. It had fascinating uh, locations in Oklahoma. Um, it had a good story and script and uh, were great performances. So it was, for I think for all of us, it was uh, this great convergence of uh, circumstances and talent. The fact that we didn't have a big crew and a lot of equipment to be able to light a forest at night. I decided that uh, it might be good to do day for night. I watched and read and did everything I could to kind of decide what was good day for night. You know, you, you see it a lot in uh very early westerns. I think that for the most part, under the circumstances of what we had and the schedule and, and budget and everything, I would say we actually did pretty well. You know, it was a classic film that uh, sort of stayed around a long time. And I really look back fondly at the whole film. You know, there are films I've done in my early career that I cringe at and say, oh, this was terrible or unfortunate or whatever. And I, I think a lot of that came from uh, bad scripts and inexperienced and bad directors. And to me, uh, Red Fern was always sort of this breath of fresh air. Uh, in my early career, and really gave me an opportunity to work in something that had a great deal more quality and substance than uh, a lot of the other films. So I, Red Fern always stood out as one of the classier, better examples of my early career. And he brought his own crew. There were six or seven of them in his crew, and they were just one uh, strong, knit family. Uh, I could tell they believed in the story, and when we saw the first dailies come in, I was totally satisfied, and the director really, really approved of these guys. Again, I had a strong feeling about uh, Dean Cundy, and he, he went right to the top, and he was one of the top cinematographers, and is, in Hollywood. He was far from my mind, at the time that we were casting the film, the one thing that I did know is that I did not, uh, I did not want a, a slick Hollywood type, uh, sort of a Disney esque type of a of a character that, uh, but somebody that was authentic, and at that age category, that's hard to do. We went to uh, Tahlequah, Oklahoma. It was such an interesting experience going there because. It was the whole heritage of the Trail of Tears, the Cherokees, and that whole story. But we were determined that uh, we would find our boy in Oklahoma, somebody that might have felt and experienced those, those things that uh, Billy Coleman uh, felt and experienced. So uh, we contacted the universities, we contacted the high schools, we... Uh, we probably read 500 boys for the part of Billy Coleman. And, and that was an arduous task because uh, the first part process of it, if somebody didn't look right, we still wanted to be gentle with the, for the people that had gone to the trouble to come in. And we would ask about them. And of course, there were other roles in the film anyway, but uh, it took us a long, long time. And after after a considerable amount of, uh, of 
of that casting and working with uh, Norman Tokar, uh, we concluded that there were five, five boys that were candidates for the part of Billy Coleman. And so my parents told me of a teacher who said that they had this, this really, really good uh, young actor. And of course you got a lot of that because uh, once they know you're producing a film, then everybody has somebody that, that can be the role. And, and, as a, and as a courtesy, of course, I, I said, sure, we'll, we'll talk to them. So the school teacher came over to my parents' home and uh, he brought his friend with him. And, the, and as he sat, and I gave him some uh, parts to read and uh, gave him a chance to come back after he'd had a chance to look at stuff. I, uh, I thought he did a pretty good job. And all the time that he was giving this, uh, this reading, it stunned me because his best friend was Stuart. And he was just sitting over there kind of nonchalant kind of wondering what the heck's going on. And I, and I could not get the, his image out of my mind. And so just as, a, just as kind of an afterthought almost, I said, hey, Stuart, do you want to, do you want to read for us? And, and he says, no, nah, I, I, I'm not really interested. And it was a little partly out of shyness and a part of, I don't know that he really did care that much. I went back to LA and I could not get it off of my mind. I could not, and this is where I say, Stuart, how'd you like to come down to uh, Disneyland? And uh, while you're here, I'll have you meet the director. Well, he perked up when I said that and uh, he decided that he would, uh, he would come. But there, there was a little, <clears throat> little more to it. In fact, he, he indicated to me that he had actually uh, prayed about it. And so, uh, I decided, well, if, if we're going to do this and he's going to meet Mr. Tokar, the director, uh, I need to get him ready. So I took him to a studio in Salt Lake or in Provo and uh, did a bunch of read-throughs. And uh, they weren't great, but there was still a little self-consciousness, but the idea of, of maybe doing something well, and of course Disneyland, he, uh, he came to LA and he was a little better rehearsed than I thought. And uh, he, did, uh, he did a much better job uh, when he worked with Norman. And Norman, I learned so much from him because he's one of these kind of people that he didn't talk about how to do something. He talked about the scene and he got Stuart to converse with him. So Stuart did that. We took him to Disneyland and uh, Norm called me and said, uh, why don't we just take him out there with the other five boys? Norman and I would work with the five, now six boys, uh, to do the very best that they could on three selected scenes. They would all do the same scenes and they would read with the same people so that there would be a, a fairness in how, we, uh, how they were judged. It was precarious because the casting director <laughs> had, had her mind on this boy from Oklahoma. She, was, she felt that he was certainly the one and it, it was like they, there was a bonding or something, but uh, uh, one by one they, they did it, they, they did their parts. And at this stage, I had, I had committed to the director uh, that, that he would have the final say. The problem was is that by now, even though I was the producer and I really did have the final say, because I realized this is the this is the movie, and so I was in that situation where I was worried that there was going to be a real problem. And uh, and and shortly thereafter, uh, Norm uh, gathered us all into the room. And uh, just very, very clearly and succinctly, he said, well, it's Stuart. 
And I, I, I thank my lucky stars that I, that he never knew. The moment he made that declaration of he's the one, uh, the casting director got up and stomped out of the room, and she didn't speak to him for the next next uh, few weeks. But uh, the decision had been made, and I knew it was the right one. And uh, and of course, <laughs> the rest of it, as that goes, is is history. Billy. Yes, Parker. I was up at Grandpa's store yesterday, and he, he told me old man Stanton's collie's about to have pups. I thought maybe we could... Papa, I don't want any old collie dog. I want hunting dogs. I know what you want, son. But hunting dogs cost money, and that's something we don't have very much of. Well, right now, there's a blue tick pup for sale. I had no inkling. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it was never an aspiration of mine. I, uh, When it came right down to it, when they narrowed it down to, to four boys and... And, we, and they asked me to, to go to Oklahoma to, to do the last screen test. Um, it was there that I I thought, you know, I ought to be a, I'm, I'm competitive by nature. And so really, the I, I think I tried harder there to win the part just so I could beat those other boys out of the part, but never had any thought about what the aftermath would be about getting that part. Uh, when Uncle Lyman came to me and said, uh, you know, you've got the part, uh, we're going to start filming in about a week, you probably ought to get your shoes off and start getting your feet toughened up. Because I'm just, I've never gone barefoot. Here we we always wore shoes because when we were in the hayfield, you just didn't run around barefoot. And uh, as a result, I it was just a shock. I was thinking, well, wait a minute, I, I need to get home. So it it was kind of a tough reality for me uh, to think about being away from home. I'd never really been too too far from home. I know that the fight that they had at the uh, the park was just behind the depot. It was made up of uh, the other five candidates, and uh, they were all very tickled to be able to be part of the film. I was an eighth grade student out at Keys Elementary, just outside of Tahlequah. Norman Tokar and his script lady came out with him, and they had all his eighth grade boys stand up because they was looking for someone to play the part of Reuben and Rainey, two cricket boys. And um, they said they preferred them to have um, dark hair. So I had long blonde hair, so I sat down in the front, and then Norman Tokar asked me to stand back up and asked me if I'd be willing to come down and read some lines at the NSU library and they might have a part for me. And I went down there. They, I read some lines. They stood me up beside Stuart Peterson and asked me if I wanted to be a standing devil. And then I had to get my mom to sign. So my mom came down the next day and they had her be a stand-in for um, Beverly Garland and an extra in the movie. And then so at that point, I uh, moved in with the movie crew, because I lived out at Cookson, which is about 12, 15 miles away from California. And uh, I moved in and stayed with Stuart Peterson. There's one thing that's, that's pretty neat out of the whole thing is when I was, we was filming the scene where they cut down the sycamore tree. And it was down on Percy Nodine's land. And this girl that lived right up the street, her name is Rhonda Aikens, and they, her and her sister came down to watch the filming. And... I jumped on the back of one of these horses and it took off running before I get up on it. And it turned right there at the fence and threw me off and I fell off the horse right in this little briar patch right there in front of this girl, Rhonda Aikens. And it just so happens that that's been my wife for the last 39 years. I still keep in touch with Stuart, I'm friends with him on social media, I have his phone number, Seth. And he's came down a couple of times here at Tahlequah. He was the grand marshal of the parade one time at the Red Burn Festival. That's when he comes down and you know, we gathered around Seth and I. In fact, the last time he was down, uh, John Lindsay, who played one of the Pritchard boys, he was here, and we got to, uh, we sat there and took some pictures. And, you know, my wife is, you know, and Stuart and I and his wife, we all sat around and talked. And, you know, just you know, they looked at my pictures, I looked at their pictures and stuff like that, you know. So it was pretty neat seeing him as an adult. Oh, well, we'll take it. That ain't no $35 dog, but 
I promised those boys a dog, and I'm going to get them one, even if it's a poor one. It was five and 25, 35. Come on, boys, let's get to the house. I sure have seen better dogs in my day. It'll be hard when we'll make something out of him. The one thing about that movie is, man, everybody got along so well. There was no fussing and fighting or quibbling amongst anyone. Anyway, yeah, but it was a lot of fun, man. We got a chance to do all those scenes in all the different parts of Oklahoma, by in. I had a lot of fun doing it, and that was back in a real, real neat time in history. You know, back in the early 70s, a lot of that country back in, in the early 70s was still like it was back in the 30s. Not a lot had changed, you know. It was right after the United States went off of the, whenever Nixon took us off the gold standard. So we, if things were still cheap, you know, candy bars were still 10 cents and so was a bottle of pop. So um, it was just a real neat time. It was nice to be able to go do some of those scenes like in buy in because that old general store is the same way it was back in the 1930s. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, man. And Wilson Rawls was still, was still alive, so he was on set. And uh, that was a question that he got asked quite a bit if he was proud of the way things turned out. And he was very proud of the way it turned out. It was just surreal at the time. You can only imagine being 14. I was a poor kid growing up over at Lucas. And uh, then all of a sudden getting catapulted into the public eye by doing a movie. It was crazy. Interestingly enough, my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Grubbs, read that book to our class and uh, when I was in the fifth grade. So little did I know I'd just go on to be Ruben Pritchard in the, in the movie. Would you like to tell us how this means love? It's a red fern, Mama. Red fern? What's that got to do with love? Alice, do you mean to tell me you've forgotten the old Indian legend about the red fern? Well, that's a symbol of the strongest kind of love. Remember all of the little sisters? Indian boy and we're, we're in the vicinity. We had the help of, uh, actually, the guy that played the part of, uh, of the depot uh, master. He was... Uh, he was in uh, in drama in in the college and and he he brought a lot of the people to us and I don't remember specifically how we got the the two sisters but uh, they were in the vicinity they were real they were authentic and that's how we got them. The posting they had for the casting call and so my father of course thinking his young daughter was just perfect for this you know he's really the one that kind of pushed me to go or and, you know my mom talked us into going down for that and um i was um a young kid i was nine i think i was just like fearless as a little kid you know you know i didn't even know what was going on so i just chatted away about our farm and my horses and all this other stuff and i think that's probably what you know norman okar was I think there was some others, and maybe Lyman too, but, and uh, I think it was just the fact that I went on and on and on, and they couldn't shut me up that they thought was somewhat endearing. You know, it was, it was pretty exciting, but I, I didn't really completely understand it was a movie and that it was a big deal. I just knew I got to get out of school, you know, so <laughs> that was really my motivation. My brother just kind of hung around, and I think that's where he obviously got his inspiration to be in the film business and you know my mother became the Oklahoma film commissioner so she did that for 15 years or something afterwards my dad even was helping from time to time on location scouting for other movies so it was kind of gave us all a new direction to go I mean it really changed the trajectory of my entire family I ultimately became veterinarian and um you know always just loved animals anyway and so to get to you know be in a situation like that where we had those great dogs around all the time and horses and chickens and all the things that were involved in the shooting of that. It was really special. Well, I think it's just important to know that movies like that do change lives. And, you know, we always see this, where are they now with young actors that were in movies as kids and terrible things happen to them. But 
I think in this case, you know, that movie definitely made me a stronger, better person. And uh, hopefully it, it gave a lot back to the people who watched it. They had ran an ad um, in the local newspaper, and they did a story on the news about the auditions coming to Tulsa. And then my mom took my older brother, my older sister, and myself all over to try out. It was a wonderful crew, and it seemed like all they listened to was Crosby, Stills, and Nash. I think I felt the love from everyone, but I really felt special because I was the youngest. And I I think everybody missed their kids, you know, and took it out on us. <laughs> And so when it was time, you know, we wrapped up and everybody was going home, I will never forget saying goodbye to Beverly, and I cried. You know, and I thought, I'm, I, I love her. You know, I'm going to miss her. I would spent several weeks, you know, with them. And I saved my money. Actually, after my sister got killed, I was just 16. We had a little tiny bit of insurance money, and I had written her a letter and asked her if I could come see her. And she said, of course, she can come see me. And being 18, I ended up using the money to put down on a car and decided not to go. That was a decision that I really regretted later because, of course, I never had it again. But that's how comfortable I felt with her and and how much I felt the love from her. I guess if I regretted anything, I wish I could have been a little older, maybe. I mean, I can't change that. But because my mom did so much uh, work on those scrapbooks, and I've gone for so many years to the schools around here, I've talked about it so much. I think that's really what's kept the memories alive for me. The older I get, the more grateful I am to her for doing the scrapbooks. A big question I get asked also is how much money did I make, which is hilarious. You know, I was raised in a very dysfunctional family, and that I got paid a lot of money for a seven-year-old at the time. And, of course, little kids think that I should be this wealthy movie star. I live in the same town that I lived in. I've worked in the same salon for 30 years. Um, a lot of people know who I am because of that, but most people always say, I can get you out in a second. You still sound the same. You still look the same. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but I'll take it. When it came to the adult actors, this was this was really interesting because we had not necessarily sent out to get Oklahoma actors. Uh, but so many of the actors that we got, even though we got them out of Hollywood or Texas and other places, their roots were in Oklahoma. Yeah, well, actually, you remember James MacArthur? Well, he is a good friend of mine, and so they they were talking to him about doing playing this my role as father of the kids, and he said, "You know who you really should get is Jackie King. He's from Oklahoma. He understands these people. He's a farm kid, and he'd be perfect." And they said, "Well, do you think he'd do it?" They said, well, why don't you bring him in and find out? So I went in to talk to him, and uh, I said, yes, I'll do it, because I love the story. So that's how I got the part, actually through James MacArthur. You know what happened to me on where the Red Fern goes? I was, we were shooting out on the Illinois River one day, and this little girl comes walking out the bushes. She lived on, we were 13 miles outside of Tahlequah, and she we come walking out, but she lived on a farm out there. And she came out to see the show folk. <laughs> so uh, we're sitting on a bale of hay having lunch, and my friend says, look, who just walked out of there. And so I jumped right up and went over and said, hi, little girl, you want to have lunch with the movie people? She said, okay. And now we've been together 44 years. And we've raised two children, and they both went to Oklahoma University, as I would want them to do. And so everything, has, it's been a, a nice journey. It's been a great life. And she's been the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And and just, you never know where, where it's coming from. I'm, I'm 86 now, so it's about time for me to pass out to her. The whole thing about movies is uh, you, you got to have a good story. And this is as good as it gets. And I was happy and proud to be a part of it. And, uh, of course, James Whitmore's from New England. But James Whitmore's James Whitmore. And uh, here was a guy that that was had such prestige. He was an actor's actor and one that so interesting and so, so bright for this particular role. It just seemed to be the case that once... 
we had Billy Coleman selected, that things just kind of fell in place. Uh, and we did meet some, re again, I met resistance on the choice of Beverly Garland. All anybody had ever seen her in were glamour roles or policewoman or whatever. And it was difficult for them to identify her as, as an Oki type. I thought she pulled it off. I thought she pulled it off quite brilliantly. And I think that she was able to discover other things about herself by doing this kind of a role that, and, and everybody did. It was, uh, there was a, it was a very close fraternity for years after, uh, after we finished this film. And uh, so uh, from a cast point of view, we, we did the work. We worked very, very hard to get the right people. But in many, many ways, it seemed like that, they, that the characters that we needed are the ones that fell in our lap. And uh, I, I, I'm grateful that it worked out that way. Well, here they are. What do you think of them? My assumption was is that once we went back to uh, Oklahoma, it would be no problem at all finding all these red bone hounds. What I soon discovered was that uh, as hound dogs go, the red bones were right on the bottom rung of the totem pole. The, the ones at the top, the walkers, the blacks and tans, the, the blue ticks, the, the, uh, all of these other, even bloodhounds. I was so fortunate to find Jenny, who was the dog trainer for the, the Waltons, Little House on the Prairie, and she loved the story. She loved the, the challenge. She loved the challenge of the story to get to find the right kind of dogs and what have you. And she actually found the, uh, the hero dogs up in Sacramento. Turns out that in Sacramento, they, they, uh, they had the same traditions as they do in Oklahoma. Of uh, I, I didn't think anything like that existed, but it still goes on, and even more so now. When it came to finding the lead dogs, the bigger problem was in the story. It talks about puppies at six weeks old. It talks about puppies when they're three quarters uh, grown, and when they're young, young dogs, and then, and then later when they're full grown. So. <laughs> In a matter of a few weeks, how are we going to do that? How are we going to accomplish all of that? And uh, man, we we checked out the same place that uh, Billy Coleman did in <laughs> in the book of going back to Kentucky, where there all these were. And we checked everywhere, and then we finally found this one breeder that believed in uh, red bones, and because he had uh, a relationship with several others, we found all kinds of them suddenly. And by the time we finished, we ended up using 16 different dogs. I've got to admit to you, Dan, that where the red fern grows <laughs> is uh, it has its own stories. It caused a lot of grief. <laughs> I remember playing golf with uh, Pat Sajak. And I'd, I'd never met him before, and we got out on the first tee, and uh, it was hard for me to hit the ball because of what he said. He said, uh, he says, where does the red fern grow? <laughs> and we thought, well, this is a simple matter. We'll go down to the store and buy us some plastic fern, and we'll dye it a rust color. That's what we did. That's the way we shot it. And I noticed that when we put a little breeze on it, it didn't quite have the, <laughs> the flimsiness that, that I had anticipated. I have to admit that to do it again, I would have, I don't know how I would have accomplished it. Maybe gone out and got a real red fern, a green one, sprayed it and put it on there and done that. So I uh, hope that doesn't ruin the ending for those 
although it doesn't matter that much after 40 years, but that's the true story, I hate to admit. After a while, it seemed that the whole process was now driving us, driving me. And the moment we set up uh, the premiere, I had a public relations guy by the name of Rick Theriot that went to Salt Lake to set up this premiere. We went there because his book was really, really popular in that area. And because of the fact that it was uh, very family oriented, we also had premieres in the South and all over the place, but this was the main one. And they had uh, eight theaters, but they were small theaters, but every one of them <laughs> was, uh, was showing where the red fern grows. And in the main theater, we had quite a distinguished group of people. The word had gotten out. People just seemed to discover it. Many of the actors from all over, Beverly Garland was there, uh, of course, Stewart. We even brought the dogs in, and the Osmonds all showed up. As we went in, <laughs> there's no way I could sit and be comfortable. So I sat at the back, and uh, as that first image came out on the screen of this small homestead, and I heard the music of Lex de Azevedo, by the way, who was, this was his really uh, first feature and who has so distinguished himself as his music came on and the, the sounds of Andy Williams, it was, I was probably not into it more than 15 or 20 seconds, and I knew we had one. I knew this was, that this worked. And I, <laughs> I assumed that it was gonna be that way thereafter, but it, it's, it's never quite been like that. In a sense, I got a false sense of what it's supposed to be like, because I, I, re, I realize now that it doesn't happen that way every time. The film went on to do very, very well in the box office. It, uh, it ended up uh, playing probably, well, it played the whole country. It played in LA, it played in New York, it played everywhere. For an independent film, it did exceptionally well, but. Now, 40 years later, that the shelf value of this project has continued. And that uh, just, uh, just in rough estimations, realize that there have been at least 10 million videos sold. Even to this day, it's shown in classrooms. Stuart is constantly asked to speak, and he's been out of the business for all these years. And I'm asked to speak. I, I speak at classrooms. and gatherings from time to time, and it just, it just has uh, taken on a life of its own. If there was any regret that I would have, it would, it would be tied to doing good and, and trying to help people maybe raise their level of, of values or whatever. We need more of those kind of value-based uh, films that I think would contribute to a happier America, uh, maybe our youth would be more prone and more apt to, to make better choices if they had values that uh, lined up with some of the values that uh, were expressed in that film, in that storyline. Those, to me, are the critical issues of today. And, and you forget. Time goes by, and you measure life by other things that you do and other films. I've done 18 films, and it was an experience in life that was kind of... Uh, <laughs> a microcosm of what you would hope your whole life would be. I've never been back to the Ozarks. All I have left are my dreams and memories. But someday, if God is willing, I'd like to go back and walk again in the hills I knew as a boy. And I'd like to touch the heart that's carved in an old sycamore tree that says Dan and Ann. And I'll look for that sacred spot by the river where the red fern grows.